you that question, but before I ask you that question, I want to emphasize something, which is that it's not a real question. It's a question that assumes the answer already, which is that that moderate voice that we do not hear is the exception, and that the voice of radicalism and extremism is the norm. I've honestly run out of ways to answer this question. How do you answer it? I'm answering it because it is that perception is shaped by the media. And the media is drawn to bloody events, violent events. Um, if the media were to cover every murder in New York City or in Los Angeles in the front page of the papers, people would be afraid to go out on the streets. They would think that you know New York City and LA is a dangerous town to, to, to walk in. Um, media shapes our perceptions. And unfortunately, uh, this is how people's, uh, you know, imagine what would happen uh, if uh, every time a suicide bombing goes off, there's a news blackout. Imagine if every time somebody says something like about Islam and wants to burn the Quran, there's a news blackout. They don't get any media attention. People wouldn't know about it. People wouldn't think that that. Is. But what's happened is that this vicious cycle that I'm talking about has grabbed people's perception. So, so people try to do interfaith dialogue and work together in, in, in the Muslim world. It, it does not, it's not newsworthy. But an Ayatollah says, death to America, America, America. That gets a better headline here. And then Americans get upset. So a U.S. colonel says, Islam is an evil religion. That becomes a better headline over there. We in Iraq should be attacking Islam. That gets a better headline. Muslims here to see that, they get upset. Then they commit something wrong. And that this vicious circle uh, is, is, is what is captivating uh, and you know, riveting people's attention. People are not looking at the many, many instances of, of mutual cooperation. How is it possible that America <coughs> has a huge footprint in the Muslim world, has bases you know, in many countries in the Muslim world, has enormous trade with, the, with many countries in the Muslim world, uh, you know, that we think this. It's funny, um, a lot of questions here, much more than I thought would, uh, there would be, uh, about this issue of where is the role for the atheist and the agnostic in this sort of interface? <laughs> and, and it's actually it's a very good question because um, both religious and non-religious leaders are always trumping you know, the, the beauty of interfaith America, the religious diversity, and, and the freedom of religion. But very rarely do we talk about freedom from religion. And, and, the, and the issue is, is what, I mean, what, what role do you see for the atheist and agnostic community in building precisely the kinds of bridges towards understanding and reconciliation and peace? I, 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 I believe atheism, when you look at religion with a small r, any belief set is, is, is religion. In other words, the religion is an ideology. Is what you're no, religion is a set of principles that we guide ourselves by. I mean, the word deen is used not only to mean religion in the, in the English, it's also used to mean the law. Quran, for example, in Surah Yusuf talks about Joseph could not take his word, read in Malik, in the law of the king. Egypt that he was in. So deen, like in Judaism, also means law. It means a set of laws that we govern ourselves by. A set of principles that we govern ourselves by. And whether you are Muslim or Christian or atheist or whatever, there is, look, you, I mean, there are, you can practice any one of those belief systems in a way that excludes the other. I mean, uh, communism was, was, extreme atheism that had no space for anybody else. Okay. You can have extremist uh, Christianity like the Inquisition, the Inquisition of Christianity, the Inquisition, 
nothing to do with the principles of Christianity, but it was his Christianity. I mean, it was packaged in such a way, there's no real difference in terms of how you deal with the other between inquisitional Christianity, inquisitional Islam, like the Taliban, uh, or inquisitional atheism, like what happened in the Soviet regime. But there are also atheists and Muslims and Christians who believe that we have to have a society which gives the space for everybody to, to, to believe in the way they want. But these are the set of principles that we live by. I mean, what does it mean to be American? It, it's no longer than one ethnicity. It's less becoming less of one language, with Spanish becoming a recognized second language in this country. It is um, increasingly multicultural. Being in America today is adherence to a set of principles. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. And they are inalienable because they inhere in the very fact that we are human. It means they are human rights, universal human rights. Now these principles are exactly what Muslims believe in. And, and, and I believe that any genuine Christian or Jew will also believe in those things. Atheist also will you not know, acknowledge the Creator, but still believes that all men are created equal. And he can believe in this set of principles. So the idea is that whatever you might be, and you share those principles, then we can build a society based upon those principles. And it's no accident to me that Thomas Jefferson read the Quran. It's no accident to me that the Supreme Court, among the likenesses of lawgivers, Muhammad is one of them. And that's why I say the Declaration of Independence is a very Sharia compliant document. <laughs> But you know, you really have to look at this because, because for those of us who are religious, those of us who take up somebody, a devout Christian, a devout Jew, a devout Muslim, what I'm saying is that these principles that, that, that our founding fathers uh, wrote really express, and when we talk about the laws of nature and of nature's God, this is the language of, of our founding document. What is the laws of nature of, of nature's God mean to a Muslim? I mean, well, the word Sharia is, is, is actually not something which is found in the Quran. That term was developed later. It's, it's, it's exactly the, the God's, demand, what we call sacred law in the Abrahamic faith traditions. That there is, a, there is a divine law, there's a law of nature. There's a law that God has established for human beings to live by. And that, the, that this law is the foundation of our ethical principles. There's a couple of really interesting questions here. I, I thought that we were going to move on from, from the, the question of Bin Laden, but there's been more than one person who has brought up this issue that I, I'm confronted with too, and, and it's the, the issue about the celebratory reactions that we saw amongst Americans uh, upon the news of Bin Laden's death. Uh, one person in particular said that it reminded them of uh, the pictures that they saw um, of you know, Muslims in Gaza and other Somalia and some parts of the, of, of the world celebrating after 9-11. Uh, obviously, I mean, this is a, a repulsive, despicable man. The world is better with him dead as far as I'm concerned. But, what was your reaction as a New Yorker um, to the sort of unbridled celebrations, the enthusiasm, the party atmosphere, really, that erupted at Ground Zero um, upon news of, of the Lama's death? Well, I have two reactions. One was I understood the emotionality. I mean, certainly after 9-11 and the, the emotional difficulty of uh, the trauma of 9-11, it's understandable that the, the emotion of uh, and you could see it on, on the television screen and people were weeping and I mean uh, the, the gamut of emotions that brought back the experience of 9-11 and for a number of people it brought a sense of closure, it brought a sense of satisfaction. So I can understand that. But I also was concerned that the, uh, 
that the seven of the great the celebration is typical. I mean, the seven of the on the Muslim world, especially follows the bin Laden, might be angry to, uh, to, to commit more acts of violence, which is why we have to be more vigilant. But these are momentary emotional outbursts. And, and the long range, the long range, uh, the, the long range of the results are what I look at at the time. And I think we, we need to emphasize and remind people of, just like we remind that 85% of the victims of al Qaeda have been Muslims in the Muslim world. And it's not to make light of what they did in, in America and in, and in Europe. But it's, 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 to, it's to, to remind ourselves that terrorism, and, and for any young person who's attracted, uh, who finds jihadism, this type of militancy, uh, attractive, and it's, it, is, it, is, it is religiously wrong. It is, uh, it, is, it is sociologically wrong. It doesn't build good society. And if you focus on that, this can become increasingly a matter of us. Uh, I'd like to now uh, invite the second member of our interfaith community uh, to ask a question, uh, the Reverend Dr. Gwen Gibord. She's the founder and president of the Gibord Center of Religion Inside Out. She also currently serves as the consultant for interfaith relations for the Episcopal Church in the United States. Welcome, Reverend Dr. Gwen Gibord. 